But I'm going to go ahead and get started. This is called the table. This is a one-off message, and it's not typically talked about in the Western church. Um, and so I'm excited about it. And I, I told one of my friends, I showed him the message, and he goes, okay, you think this one part, this part's controversial? And he goes, someone has to do it. And I was like, all right. So, uh, so I'm going to get started. So Miwa Sato, give me some hearts if you can hear me. Miwa Sato was found dead in her apartment while holding her phone. She was a reporter for the NHK, Japan's national broadcaster, and had been covering two local Tokyo elections before she passed away. So this lady, she worked tirelessly for long hours, logging in 159 hours of overtime, and she barely ever took a day off. And this actually caused her to suffer from congestive heart failure, and she was only 31 years old when she died. I'm going in hot, I'm telling you. And so Joey Takong, a 27-year-old trainee from the Philippines, also died of heart failure after working for 122 hours of overtime at a Japanese casting company. So J Japan and, and a few other Asian countries is, is well known for this social issue, and it's the, they have a word for it, it's called karoshi. And it means, literally, it means death from overwork. This word, they have a word for it there. Um, Kiroshi, you're, you're dying from overwork. And so unfortunately, the rest of the world seems to be following this same path as deaths caused by overwork continues to rise globally. And so according to a report in the UN, the average 40 hour per week employee in the US is working an additional 400 hours per year. Maybe because of the invention of the phone, which is equivalent to 10 more weeks of work. And on the other hand, in China and India, India the average working hours per year are above 2,100. And this has been the case for the past five decades. And so the biggest thing that can mess with your spiritual life is being too busy. I'm a victim of this all the time. But I want, I want to bring up something. Have you ever heard of this ancient practice called the Shabbat? It's where we get the word Sabbath from, but in the Hebrew, it actually means to stop, to take a break, or just to be done. So the Sabbath, the Hebrew word is Shabbat. In pretty much every society, whether they're Christian, pagan, or whatever they are, they go by a seven day cycle, and on the seventh day, which is called the Shabbat in Hebrew, we're supposed to rest. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, try not to clap every time. So it says, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. This is the beginning. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy. He made that day holy, not another one. And because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he done. And so when God made the seventh day holy and he blessed it, the Hebrew term for holy, Kadesh, originates from the word kadash. In simpler words, it refers to being set apart for a particular purpose. So when he made, he made it holy, he set apart that day. And when the Bible uses the term holy, it's not referring to purity or righteousness. Instead, it's denoting something that is distinct from everything else and designated in order to do a job. And so interestingly, the seventh day was already significant to God even before Adam and Eve's fall from grace. They weren't even living yet. And it's fascinating that God tied the Sabbath or the Shabbat to the act of creation itself. And so by observing and honoring the Sabbath, we're actually acknowledging our connection to the Creator, God. And so in the Hebrew Bible, the number seven represents completeness or fullness. So seven, if you see seven a lot, it's always got to be vibes. You start throwing a, a bunch of sixes out there, and everyone's like, I don't know. But the seventh day, 
And he chose the family of Israel to experience ultimate rest and and share it with others. While they were on this journey, God invited them to start living as if they were in the promised land, even though they're in the wilderness and in the desert. And God instructed them back then to stop their work every seventh day in Shabbat or Sabbath in in, in Hebrew, Shabbat, so they could rest and enjoy God's creation. So Shabbat begins, I'm talking about the Hebrew calendar here. It's, we went through Babylon and all this other stuff, so our calendars are all crazy right now. And that's fine. I'm not, uh, so leave it at that. So Shabbat, Shabbat begins at sunset Friday evening, and it ends at sunset Saturday evening. Sorry, I'm trying to get to my control here. All right. So it says in Exodus 29 through 11, on six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God, or a Shabbat, and on it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or your daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreign residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he made it holy. And then we'll move on to the scripture. So this is interesting. So they saved it until morning as Moses commanded. Now this is the manna that's coming down from the sky because they want food. So they, they saved it until morning as Moses commanded, and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is the Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath or the Shabbat, there will, will not be any. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. And then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day he gives you the bread for the two days, and everyone is to stay where they are on the seventh day, and no one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. So far, I don't think it's a bad gig. God's basically saying, you get a day off. I don't care what you have to do. It's, I want you to rest. I don't care. I don't, I don't want you to check your email. I don't really care. So, <laughs> all right. The people of Israel called the bread manna, and it was white like coriander seed, and it tasted like wafers made with honey. Sounds all right. And Moses says, this is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer, like a measurement of manna, and keep it for the generations to come. So they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the wilderness when I brought you out of Egypt. And so Moses said to Aaron, take a jar and put an omer of manna in it and then place it before the Lord to be kept for generations to come. So uh, the Israelites had to gather manna every day. And they, they, had made, they had to make sure they got twice the amount before the Sabbath to avoid working on that day. And those who took too much of it would find it rotting with maggots in their tents. And I think God's trying to say something with that part. And while those who failed to collect enough before the Sabbath would go hungry. And through providing manna, God taught the Israelites to rely on him and entirely to rest on the Shabbat or the Sabbath. And so does the Shabbat only apply to Israelites? Or is it also for believers in Christ like Gentiles, as stated in Ephesians 2, 11, 13, 19? Believers are, actually, let me see if I have it up here. Uh, not yet, we got that guy. But it says, believers are no longer considered strangers or foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. So therefore remember that at one time, you Gentiles, I'm a Gentile, in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is 
called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at the time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And therefore it can be argued, and this is not a debate, you can, that the Sabbath is not exclusive to the Israelites, but it's for all who have become part of God's family through faith in Christ Jesus. And so I'm going to go into a quick little history thing that uh, most churches probably will never talk about this stuff. And, uh, and it may look like I'm a hypocrite because uh, I'm having a service on a Sunday, but I can have it on any day, but just not the seventh day. And so during his reign as emperor, emperor, emperor I mean, let me, I need it. All right, I probably need some water. Hold on a second. Sorry. <clears throat> during his reign as emperor of the Roman Empire, Constantine, who had previously worshipped the sun, converted to Christianity on his deathbed in 321 CE. And he declared Sunday as the day of worship, and he issued a decree that magistrates and the city residents should rest on this vertible day of the sun with all workshops remaining closed. So he was a sun god worshiper. Um, and then he has this vision and stuff and something happens. And however, Constantine also wanted to ensure that Easter and Passover were celebrated at different times. And to achieve this, he gathered Christian bishops in Nicaea, Turkey in AD 325 for the first council of Nicaea. And this event formally separated the church from the Hebrew calendar. So that's how the, the calendar changed. And I, I want to read this to you because it's it's interesting. Well, if you look at that image right there, you'll see his coin on there has the sun god on the back of it, which is interesting. And so it says the epistle of the emperor Constantine. This is a real thing. You can look it up. Concerning the matters transacted at the council addressed to those bishops who were not present. This is what it says. And you tell me if this sounds like a, a nice Christian tone. It was in the first place declared improper to follow the customs of the Jews in the celebration of this holy festival. Because their hands have been stained with crime, the minds of these wretched men are necessarily blinded. Let us then have nothing in common with the Jews who are our adversaries. Let us studiously avoiding all contact with that evil way for how can they entertain right views on any point who, after having compassed the death of the Lord, being out of their minds, are guided not by sound reason, but by an unrestrained passion where, wherever their innate madness carries them, lest your pure mind should appear to share in the customs of a people so utterly deprived. Therefore, this irregulatory, I'm sorry, this must be corrected in order that we may no more have anything in common with those parasites and those murderers of the Lord. No single point in common with the perjury of the Jews. And that letter, it just didn't seem very Christian to me. I'm just, I'm just saying. And so to really understand Christianity, it's important to remember Jesus was born and raised Jewish. And so, uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's Jewish. He was raised Jewish. And he taught in Judea, which was a Roman providence. And at the time, while he was on, he was one of many teachers back then, he was also seen as a special messianic figure. Of course, he's the son of God. And the Romans felt threatened by Jesus, and they eventually crucified him. And later on, some people even wrongly blamed the Jews for his death, like in that letter there. And after the Romans destroyed the temple and exiled the Jewish people from Judea, they had to re redefine what it meant to be Jewish without a central place of worship. There's no temple. And at the same time, Jesus' followers chose to include non-Jews like myself or Gentiles, which is how Christianity became a global religion. And so even though Christians were persecuted and martyred by the Roman Empire, the religion continued to grow, and when Emperor Constantine permitted the worship of Jesus and, confer and converted to Christianity himself after a vision, the religion gained momentum. 
And some believe he did it for political reasons. But regardless, everyone wanted to be like the emperor, which further spread Christianity. And so in the fourth century, <laughs> just a little more of this and I'll go back to Shabbat. In the fourth century, the Catholic Church decided to shift the day of rest, the Shabbat, the seventh day that God talks about in the beginning of the Bible, from Saturday to Sunday. And this decision was made at the Council of Lycia in AD 336. The Catholic Church believed they had divine power from Jesus Christ himself to make this change. They wanted to move away from Jewish customs and emphasize the importance of honoring the Lord's day. And Canon 29 of the Council of Lycia states that Christians should not rest on the Sabbath, but, it should, but they should instead work and honor Sunday as a day of the rest. And those who continue to rest on Saturday, the Shabbat, were seen as going against the church's teachings and could be even ex excommunicated. And so a decision from God, is it? I don't know. It's mainly because of tradition, this whole Sunday deal. However, it's, it's worth noting that the Sabbath, the Shabbat, is supposed to be on the seventh day, not the other day. And then God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy because on it he rested from all of the work of creating that he had done. So there's no biblical evidence to support the idea that the Sabbath was changed from the seventh day of the week to the first day, which would be Sunday. And so many Christians see Sunday as the Sabbath day when they attend church, they listen to sermons, they serve, they socialize with other believers, but the Sabbath is more than just a day to go to church. That wasn't its intention. It was originally meant as a day of rest and relaxation as God himself rested on the seventh day after creating the world. And he even declared the Sabbath as holy and blessed it. And so Jesus actually observed Shabbat when he was living in Nazareth. And if you watch The Chosen, he and his disciples are doing Shabbat. And when he grew up and became an adult, he used to preach in the synagogues on the Sabbath because you can do good on the Sabbath. The Pharisees hated this. And as we can read in Luke 4, 16, and after Jesus died and was buried and resurrected in the first century AD, the apostle Paul also preached on the Sabbath to the Gentile congregations. Because the Gentiles would come up to Paul and be like, we want to hear about the way that Jesus, we want to hear about Jesus. And so they would preach on that day. And so I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next. I love this part, man, because I just got a huge revelation after I read it a million times. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? And he answered, I don't know, someone got real big in here. And he answered, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? And in the days of Abathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and he ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat, and he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is even Lord of the Sabbath. Seemed like a real big, huge white thing popping around. I guess it's a beard. So listen to this really quick. Jesus didn't break the law by snacking on the Sabbath. Jesus and his disciples having a little appetizer, or so a little wheat appetizer. They're not breaking anything. They weren't working the fields. However, he did reference an incident in which David, who was hungry and in need, entered the house of God and he ate the showbread along with his companions. And Jesus pointed out this to the Pharisees who were criticizing him for eating on the Sabbath. It's another mic drop. He's like, we can eat on here. We're not, we're not doing anything wrong. And God didn't create the Sabbath for you to serve it. He created it to serve you as a source of blessing, not a burden. And in this passage, Jesus is changing the way people understand the Sabbath or Shabbat. And in and, and that time, the Jews had to follow many rules and customs to keep the Sabbath holy, which made it very difficult for them. 
The Pharisees had added, <coughs> excuse me, so many requirements that it became a heavy burden to observe the Sabbath or Shabbat. And Jesus is not abolishing the Sabbath law, but rather criticizing the Pharisees' legalistic observance of it. And the early Jewish followers of Jesus, hold on one second, let me get to the next slide here. And so the early, I love this part right here, the early, the early Jewish followers of Jesus didn't start a new religion called Christianity. They were just Jews who followed a rabbi named Yeshua, which is Jesus' name in Hebrew. And as more people joined, a new type of Judaism called the Way was formed. And I kind of wish I was part of the Way, because all these denominations and all this stuff, it just starts getting real muddy after a while. So I just, I just say I'm non-denomination, but there's lots of stuff missing still. And so they still went to the temple in Jerusalem. They went to synagogues wherever they lived. They did Shabbat, and they celebrated Jewish festivals like the Torah told them to. There was no Christianity or Gentile church like today back then. And when the Romans ruled Israel, they thought of the way as a Jewish sect and probably a threat. And so they would draw a fish in the dirt with their finger. And you probably you probably seen the fish on by, you know behind someone's car. And when you see it, you probably are like, oh, they're Christian. And so they would draw a fish in the dirt with their finger. And if that person didn't recognize what it was, then they were part of the way. And so it was almost like a secret society because you get killed for being a believer of the way of Jesus. And so Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And just because we don't observe the Sabbath or Shabbat doesn't mean we should neglect gathering together for corporate worship with fellow believers on other days of the week, including Sunday like we're doing here. It's still important to do, do it for most of the reasons stated in the New Testament. But most people, including the Pharisees, have never really understood why God, since the beginning of the creation of time, instituted the Sabbath or Shabbat. And unfortunately, even the church, this commandment kind of has got lost. And so... Ten Commandments. You shall have no other God before me. You shall make no idols. Sounds pretty reasonable. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Number four, keep the Sabbath day holy. Like, nah, I'm good. Uh, five, honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. That sounds reasonable. You shall not, not commit adultery. Okay. You shall not steal. Sounds good. You shall not bear fault witness, false witness against your neighbor. That sounds good. You shall not covet. So I can do a drive-by at 7-Eleven and, and uh, cuss everyone out with an idol on my front of my hood, and, and, and that's good. It's not. Although the fourth commandment is one of God's top, t top ten rules, it only instructs us to rest on the Sabbath, and it doesn't specifically mention attending church on Sunday. It's important to understand that all ten commandments here are equally significant and interconnected. So neglecting the fourth commandment which is about keeping the Sabbath holy is just as serious as disregarding any of the other nine commandments. And so, I don't know what was my mind. But anyway, let me see if I have something for this one. So in Luke 13, 10 through 17, I love this part, man. Jesus heals a crippled woman on the Sabbath, on Shabbat. And on a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues because it, it's you can you can do good on the Sabbath. You can have fun. You can rest. It got all legalistic, the Pharisees. And Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues, and the woman who was there had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. And she was bent over and could not straighten up at all. And when Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her, and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the synagogue leader said to the people, There are six days for work, so come and be healed on those days, but not on the Sabbath. <laughs> and the Lord answered him. He's always causing trouble on the Sabbath, but he's the Lord of the Sabbath. They're just adding too much legalistic stuff to it. 
You hypocrites, doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie your ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. And so the Sabbath, the Shabbat, the seventh day is a day for healing. I don't know if you noticed it, it's not by coincidence, Jesus performed some of his most amazing miracles on the Sabbath. He healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law, a man with a withered hand, a man born blind, a crippled woman, a man with dropsy, whatever that is, I don't know, drove out an evil spirit and he healed a lame man by the pool of Bathsheba. I'll just leave that picture up because it's cool. And in Matthew 12, 11 through 12, it says, He said to them, If any of you has a sheep and it falls in a pit on the Sabbath, will you not take a hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. So he's saying, yeah, you can do good on it. It's a day I created for you to rest, and you can do good on it. You want to go preach on it? Go for it. You know, you want to do good? You want to relax? In Mark 3, 4, it says, And he said to them, it is lawful to do good or to, to is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath to save a life or to kill but they kept silent and some folks believe that Jesus dying on the cross means we don't have to follow his commandment to keep the Sabbath or Shabbat while others say that once we trust in Jesus he becomes our Sabbath and we don't need to keep the commandment and the Ten Commandments anymore and it's pretty confusing and my head's kind of spinning from it. But the thing is, Jesus himself gave us the Sabbath or the Shabbat. And he even said that it was a gift for us. So why would he take it away if it was a gift for us? And there's no verse in the Bible that says Jesus replaced the Sabbath or became the Sabbath. However, the Bible does tell us that he's the Lord of the Sabbath, which means the Sabbath belongs to him and it was a gift. So if I'm Lord of the Starbucks, I'm over it. I don't care what the Pharisees are saying. No, you're not going to get your latte. You're not getting your cappuccino this way. I'm the Lord of the Starbucks. It's my thing, and I want you to enjoy it. And he's the Lord of the Sabbath. And he, they sep and God separated that day on the seventh day, holy. And so, let's see what else we got here. And so God declares that the Sabbath is not just a commandment, but it's also a gift to his people, like I said. He gave the Sabbath as a day for rest, worship, and enjoyment. It's a special day that is set apart from the rest of the week, and it's meant to be a time of rejuvenation and spiritual renewal. And so when we Shabbat, we're not just obeying a commandment, but we're also receiving a gift from God. And the Sabbath, <coughs> excuse me, is God's gift. But as with any gift, it must be received, open, and used. And in John 19, 31, 37, I don't know why I put this scripture here, but I feel like I was supposed to. It's kind of heavy. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath or a Shabbat, because the Jewish leaders did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. And the soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. And the man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe these things happened so that the scripture will be filled that not one of his bones will be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on, on the one they pierced. And uh, right now, so now we're going to go through the Sabbath, the Shabbat. Uh, and I'm going to read this one too, because a lot of people say it's abolished. This is uh, in Isaiah, and they're talking about when Jesus comes back at the very end. It says, as the new heavens and the new earth that I make will endure before me, 
declares the Lord, so I will so will your name and descendants endure from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath or Shabbat to another. All mankind will come and bow down before me, says the Lord. So that seventh day, it, it, I didn't see expiration date on it. He's, he's saying that when he comes back and God created it as a gift for us. And um, I'm not telling you me to do it. I'm not a seventh day Adventist. I'm just a a non-denominational dude that um, believes in these Hebrew roots and hidden stuff in the Bible that I think that is important. And that's for you to you look on your own accord and, and research everything. I'm, I'm not making stuff up here. You can look it up. But let's go through the, the, the Shabbat and we can get around the table and I'll come, I'll come join you. So what, what does the, when does the Shabbat begin? Instead of days beginning at midnight, like we're used to in our culture, the days on the Hebrew calendar start at sundown. Our calendar got changed. And so the Sabbath is from sundown on Friday evening until Saturday evening. And so we take a break from the internet. I'm going to get this out of the way. So we take a break from the internet, the TV, and your cell phone. So on Friday, literally, I'm like, dude, I've got a bunch of emails coming in. People want this. People want that. I'm just like, I'm done. I take a break from everything, the internet, TV, your cell phone for a while. But if there's an emergency or something really important comes up, it's okay to deal with it. Jesus talked about this too in a calming, sending way to the Pharisees. He gets it. He said, if your ox falls in the ditch on Shabbat, you should help it out. So it's not about being legalistic and rigid, but about finding a balance between resting and taking care of important matters like oxes and ditches. So if gardening brings you delight or whatever this is, it's good. If checking your email gives you anxiety, maybe rest, rest from it and so on. And so the components of Shabbat, the candles symbolizing Jesus as the light of the world. You see that at the table in there. And lighting the candles acknowledges his presence and it invites him into your home. And typically two candles are lit during a traditional Jewish Shabbat meal. And then you got the wine or, or grape juice representing the blood of Jesus. Wine or grape juice is a common element. And then you got the bread and we make this bread. I think it's cool to make this bread because Jesus had it at the last Passover or the last supper, ate that same bread. So I make that same recipe, it's freaking good. And although challah is often used during Jewish Shabbat dinners, any type of bread you can use, crackers maybe use, all this stuff. And so we're gonna, I gotta put this stuff up. This is gonna be kind of tricky to do because I need to come over there. So what you do, it's Friday, I'm done with work. People are bothering me, they, these clients and stuff. Hey man, what do you need to do this? Drama, drama, drama. All kinds of stuff happening. And I'm a workaholic. And so I'm like, dang, I don't, I gotta stop. And so I do, because God said on the seventh day, he blessed it and he made it holy. So I'm gonna come up to the candles and we light the candles and we invite his presence, two candles, and say, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by your word, commanded us to be a light to the nations, and had, has given us Yeshua, Jesus in the name of Hebrew, our Messiah, the light of the world. And then I could do the Hebrew, but I'm going to skip that part because I'll butcher it. And then, then we take the wine or grape juice, depending on what you do in your household. Uh, we do wine, and, and I grab the wine and lift it up, table. Blessed are you, our Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. Baruch atzai Adonai Elamahak Halam Pri Magafin. That eh, wasn't too bad. <laughs> and then, then we get the bread, this big old crazy loaf of bread here. And we lift, lift the bread or whatever you want to do. I mean, you can throw it like a football. Blessed are you, our Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth the bread from the land. And, and you can see this is like communion. The wine is the blood of Jesus, of course, and this is his body, a Messiah that was given for us. And then we lift our glasses around the table and Shabbat Shalom. And then we eat a big dinner and we go into a food coma, amen. And then I don't look at my phone. I don't look at my email, I just rest because God said on the seventh day, he blessed it. And so if someone's like, I'm gonna give you all this money and work on this day, 
I'm going to say no because God said for me to rest on that day. And so, and that's and that's what I did. And so I'm going to put up a quick uh, quick video and then we'll go into worship. And so I've been doing it for 12 years. Um, you know, I got saved at a radical deal and started going to church and I just started being like, man, I know there's more to this. And I kept just being like, you know, mega churches, working at mega churches, this and that, membership and baby dedication, da da da. I started working for the church, started getting burnt out, serving too much. I never rested. I thought the Sabbath was on Sunday, but it's on the seventh day. And, and it, it, if you don't, if that doesn't vibe with you, I'm not telling you you need to do it because God says it's a gift. It's a gift for us. If I don't rest, I'll die. I'll end up like my dad and straight up have a stroke and fall over. Because you can't overwork yourself to death. And God wants you to fight the good fight. And he blessed the seventh day. And so I'm just going to pray. And then I want to put up a worship video. And God, just pray right now that Jesus, that you would sit at this table with us. That you would give revelation to those that maybe just need to even try this. Let's light some candles, grab a cracker, whatever. But don't be legalistic about it because Jesus wasn't legalistic about it. The Pharisees were. They were. He wasn't. He was making trouble on the Sabbath. He was like, I'll heal that person on the Sabbath because you can do good on the Sabbath. If your car falls off the side of a cliff, go get it. The Pharisees probably would say, you're sinning. And the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so God, just pray that you give revelation to everyone here if they need their rest or if they need the Shabbat and, and, and have rest, God. We need your rest. This world is consumed with social media, emails, work, side hustles, all this stuff. We don't care. We'll give it to you on the seventh day to bring us true rest. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to go ahead and put up a worship song, and I really appreciate you guys coming. Um, it's a kind of a controversial message, and I don't mean it in, a, in, a, in, a way, in that kind of way. Of course, we should worship on Sunday. Yes, absolutely. That's what we're doing. You should worship every day. But on the seventh day, God says there's something supernatural there, and, and I'll leave it at that. So go ahead and uh, put this worship video up.